Thank you very much, uh, Megan. Uh, namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. I join my friend uh, Judith in expressing uh, my own gratitude and honor for the opportunity to be with all of you and uh, to thank all of you for being here, to thank all of the sponsors and supporters of this wonderful uh, gathering, and of course, to acknowledge our indebtedness to FETSA, who brought us and made it possible for us to come, come together. The name Hinduism is now widely used, but that ism <laughs> is a Western imposition. There is no uh, Sanskrit equivalent for the ism <laughs> that is added. And it is often, it, it's misleading because this is a family of, of traditions. So when we think of Hinduism or as I prefer, Hindu traditions, we are thinking of an ancient, many branched family sharing things in common but preserving the rich beauty and uh, distinctiveness of an ancient family. Any attempt to homogenize this tradition always ends up privileging some branch of it or some expression of it. So what I want to do uh, this afternoon is to take you on a quick pilgrimage. And in this pilgrimage, we will visit a few important places, a few important traditions. And uh, I'll tell you a story from each of these uh, traditions. I will not comment too much on the interpretations of these stories, and I'll leave that uh, to, to you. But there are many stories, and uh, there are many places of, of pilgrimage. In fact, the Hindu tradition thinks of life itself as, as a pilgrimage. And in many of our sacred texts, the image of the chariot is, is used. The metaphor of the chariot to speak of life as a pilgrimage. And uh, the chariot itself is the human body. The five horses that draw this chariot are our five senses. The reins used to control the horses are our minds. The driver is spirituality, spiritual wisdom, spiritual practice, and the passenger is you uh, or I. So when the senses and the mind are controlled and guided by, by wisdom, the traveler reaches her destination. If not, we lose our way. So using this metaphor of a pilgrimage, let us visit a few Hindu places of wisdom. And I want to begin with my own tradition, my own, the tradition of my own study and, and practice, which is a non-dual Hindu tradition. Uh, the Sanskrit word is Advaita, which literally means not two. It's not one, it's not two, it is it's not one or two, it is not, not two. <laughs> and that's important. <laughs> In this tradition, paradoxically, our destination is always our starting point. In one way or the other, we travel to come back home. In this case, to come back to, to ourselves. The fundamental insight of the Advaita tradition is unity. It is oneness 
at the heart of all reality. We are to discover the truth of this oneness in ourselves and in all beings. So there are many stories in the sacred texts comparing us to people who have lost their homes and longing to return back home, or members of a royal family who have grown up in the homes of bird catchers and forgot their identities. But let me tell you one perhaps very famous story from this non-dual tradition. This story tells of 10 disciples of a great teacher who went on a pilgrimage. And along this journey, they came to a swollen river, a river in great flood. Some were good swimmers and some could not swim very well, but they entered into the raging river. When they thought that all of them had made it safely to the opposite shore, the leader decided to take account and sadly came to the conclusion that they had lost one of their friends. The tenth person did not make it. They each counted and came to the same conclusion, we lost our tent companion. They fell into deep sorrow, a disconsolate group sitting in the forests, sure that a friend was swept away. A woodcutter on his way home after a long day's work saw this group of despondent young persons and stopped and asked about the problem. And they explained their journey and the tragic end. The woodcutter said, okay, let's be sure. Tell me, how did you come to the conclusion that you lost one? And I asked the leader to count again. So he lined up his friends counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and said, see, one is missing. And of course, you've <laughs> anticipated the, the wise woodcutter's answer, you are the tenth person. The tenth person was never lost, only lost in, in ignorance. What a relief, what a, what a, discovery. That which was lost was not lost. It was right there all along, concealed in a deep ignorance. But let us go to the Vaishnava tradition, the tradition that celebrates God as, as Vishnu and especially Vishnu's incarnation as, as Krishna. And here, if the Advaita or the non-dual tradition calls our attention to the divine reality that dwells equally in every human heart and unites us as a single family, the Vaishnava tradition calls our attention to the divine as relational, the divine who reveals itself through personal relationships. In the case of Krishna, he invites us into his leela. Leela is a, a Sanskrit word that means divine play. But leela is joyful action, actions that express joy. The kind of joy that we know, especially in our relationships with children who know the meaning of play for its own sake. Leela is play that is, that is its own end. We, as, we, as we grow up, you know, our lives become consumed with goal and, and outcome-oriented activities, and we have lost this ability just to play for the sake of play. 
So Krishna, we celebrate in the Hindu tradition Krishna as child. And for the reason that he exemplifies life as play, as joyful activity that is, is its own end. He is the flute player whose music, whose melodies are irresistible. And he is the divine dancer who invites us to dance with him. He multiplies himself in this circle of dance so that every dancer has a Krishna with one condition. If you think that you are the only person dancing with him, he disappears from your presence. So he will be with you, he will dance with you as long as you also acknowledge that he dances with, with everyone else. So let me tell you a story of his childhood, a famous and, and loved story. One day he is playing with his friends, his brother, and they all went, rushed to his mother, Mother Yashoda, and complained that her son had eaten dirt. And she was always anxious about his well-being and took him up into her arms to scold him. Dear Krishna, said Yashoda, why are you so restless that you have eaten dirt? Your friends and your brother are complaining about what you have done. And he said, mother, I have not eaten dirt. My friends are not telling the truth. If you think that they are being truthful, why don't you look into my, into my mouth? And Yashoda challenged him, if this is so, open your mouth. And holding her baby in her lap, he opened his mouth. And Yashoda looked. And when she looked, she didn't see a speck of dirt, but she saw galaxies. She saw the universe with mountains and moons and stars and oceans and forests in her baby's mouth. His divinity, she discovered divinity holding her child in her arms, even as his friends discovered divinity in playing with with him. So let's move from the Vaishnava tradition to the Shaiva tradition, those traditions that are centered on the divine as Shiva. And the Shaiva tradition, like Shiva himself, reveals the divine in a special way to be associated with change and with time. Shiva reminds us that even as we value and seek stability, change is inevitable. On his flowing hair in, his, in the iconography of Shiva, there is the crescent moon representing time, the symbol of time, reminding us that there is no life without movement and motion there can be no peace without our acceptance of impermanence. So Shiva, as a face of the divine, invites us to see the positive possibilities in change. And he is always found in unexpected places. So the icons of Vishnu in the Hindu tradition are always resplendent. The it's the iconography of royalty and, and kingship. But the iconography of Shiva has him in unexpected places. We don't find him in the palaces, but we find him in the cremation grounds, dressed in beggarly attire, smearing himself with the ash of burning funeral pyres. If Krishna's spaces are more familiar, the domestic spaces, Shiva is not. His companions are not friends that we are familiar with, but they are goblins and ghosts. <laughs> they despise and they marginalize. He's ostracized 
in his stories by his father-in-law because of his beggarly attire and, the, and uh, the despise the company that he keeps. So to find Shiva, we must be prepared to look in unusual places and be prepared to join company unfamiliar uh, to us. He reminds us that we must not place limits on divine reality. Our boundaries are not Shiva's boundaries. Our notions of purity and impurity are not Shiva's own. Shiva is the face of the divine as the Lord of time and change, but he embodies compassion. And one of his stories, perhaps the most famous story, because this one is also connected with the most important festival of Shiva, which is the Shivaratri festival, the night of Shiva. And uh, it, it's a story about how he got one of his most famous name, the blue-throated one, Nila Kanta, the one who has a blue throat. So this story tells or begins with the primeval ocean. And uh, this ocean is churned by living beings in search of the nectar of immortality. And so they begin to churn the ocean. And many uh, life-enhancing gifts emerge from the ocean, but also a terrible poison that quickly spreads and threatens uh, life itself, causes suffering, uh, chokes and destroys life. They run, they run everywhere, seeking someone who could bring this poison to stop this poison, halt its spread. No one was willing to take the risk until they found uh, Shiva, who without hesitation stepped forward, gathered the poison in his hands, ingested it, but did not swallow it. Interesting. <laughs> Kept it in his throat. And his throat has the blue mark of that poison. He is, he is Neil, Neil Akanta, the blue-throated one. Our final stop is in the Shakta tradition. The Shakta tradition are all of those traditions, uh, all of those Hindu traditions that focus on the divine as feminine the feminine face of God. Focuses on the feminine as the mother of the universe in all of her wonderful forms as Durga, Saraswati, Lakshmi. All of these forms have multiple uh, forms. All of these faces have many uh, uh, faces. This is how diversity manifests itself in these traditions. When when sh we, we speak of it as the Shakta traditions because there's the Sanskrit word Shakti, which means power, which means uh, energy. So when she is associated with a masculine representation of the divine, she is the Shakti. She is the creative energy without which the masculine is helpless. She provides the, she animates the, uh, the, 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 the male, He's, he's unable to act without the shakti or the energy of the feminine. So she, in stories, she is the Lakshmi of Vishnu. She is the Parvati of Shiva. She is the Saraswati of Brahma. She is the Sita of Rama. She is the Radha of Krishna. But she is also the supreme reality, the divine mother, the fullness of the divine as source, sustainer, and end. There's a nine night festival called Durga Puja, usually in the fall, that celebrates her in all of her splendid forms, also called Navratri, the nine nights. The story of this of Durga Puja is the story of a a powerful being that arose. His name is Mahesh Asura. And he unleashed a reign of terror on earth, threatening 
the very existence of the universe itself. His might was terrifying, and uh, he also enjoyed a special boon, and the boon is that he could not be destroyed by any male. He was so arrogant <laughs> that he, this is what he asked for, because he thought there was no male to defeat him. He was very... Um, he didn't think that he needed to ask uh, to make females an exception, <laughs> so he didn't think that there was any female who could ever destroy him. And so the, in, in this story, there was this grand epic battle between uh, Mahesh Asura and all of the, the male uh, figures, and they are unable to defeat him until they realized that they had to invoke the feminine. They needed Durga. And so the male deities, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, invoked the mighty Durga and gave to her, she brought her own Shakti, her own energy, but they also gave her their, their energies. And riding on a lion, Durga challenged uh, Mahesh Asura and entered into battle with him. He was no match for her and, uh, for, and for her skills as a warrior and soon suffered defeat at, his, uh, at her hands. The, one of the beautiful things about the divine as Durga is that while in the stories there's this emphasis on her shakti and her power and her, her might, this is combined beautifully and it's, it's, it's present in so much of the devotional music and poetic compositions that um, address her. She is as tender as you can imagine. She brings the tenderness of a mother with, that, with the energy of the feminine uh, divine, com combining these in such uh, beautiful ways. The stories that I shared with you, you know, these are stories found in the official canons, as we would say. But these stories are unending. They continue to be told creatively, told and retold, adapting to regional contexts and, and realities. And although I have told these stories as though these uh, faces of the divine or these forms or expressions of divine are separate, they are also very beautiful, iconic representations of the divine that combine them all. All of the faces can be found um, in single icons, um, beautiful icons that are half male, half female, or, or combine uh, Vishnu and Shiva and Durga, speaking about their unity, their oneness, and their relationality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anant. I appreciated being a fellow traveler on the pilgrimage that you just took us on. I appreciate this image of a family of traditions when speaking about the Hindu traditions. And I think for each of us, as we think about our own faith traditions, we, we might also describe our own traditions as a family with the immense diversity and variety of stories and teachings depending on where you live or what sub-tradition you belong to. And so I'm curious, what does it look like to embrace collectivity, diverse voices, and communal storytelling as we think about our sacred stories, but while also having something shared, something we can say together. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. Thank you, thank you, uh, Megan. I think in the, in the Hindu tradition, clearly, looking, looking at the tradition historically, and uh, the Hindu tradition, all of these uh, stories that I shared today, 
They also uh, can be located in some ways uh, geographically in India. So that, you know, uh, Shiva, the form of God as Shiva, the divine as Shiva, is particularly present in southern India. If you, it's when you go to southern India that you see some of the most ancient Shiva temples. Um, north would be, you know, more predominantly Vishnu, or northeast would be uh, Durga, or the feminine forms of the divine. And clearly, you know, these different ways of thinking about the divine, representing the divine, evolve historically in these regions of, of India. But as, you know, as these regions interacted with each other and they got to learn about each other's traditions, what we saw happening is the development of the understanding that all of these uh, forms, while they reveal very important important and precious insights about the divine, they are expressions. They are the many faces of one ultimate reality. So we have this beautiful, uh, very ancient uh, seminal text in the, in the Rig Veda. One, the being or truth is one, wise people. And that's important. Wise people speak of this one differently. It is not the foolish who speak differently, but the wise, the wise ones speak differently. The point here being that when wise people speak differently, we should pay attention. <laughs> there, is, there is wisdom in, that, in those different ways of, of speaking. And I think that um, Megan... In, in our own, bringing this question to our own project, as, as Judith spoke about what, um, how they approach the Buddhist uh, telling, we also had to wrestle and contend with our, with our differences. And um, we wanted to, to celebrate those differences. You know, we had among us uh, scholars and practitioners who came from all of the traditions that I, I described, and we wanted to honor and to lift up the distinctive insights of all of those traditions. But also, it brought us into a dialogue through which we found all that we shared as well. And uh, even intra religiously, that was very important uh, for us. So, to affirm our common ground but also to celebrate and learn from our differences and our diversity. Yes, it's what is said within each story and within each sub-tradition, but also between in the dialogue. Yes, yes. thank you, Anand. <laughs>